Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fies from Central New Mexico Community College. I continue here with video B on the blood out of a series of seven videos total. This video B is going to focus on red blood cells and hemoglobin. Red blood cells are pretty amazing cells. They make up about a third of all of the cells in a human. That's an amazing number. As a matter of fact, when we look at a more absolute red blood cell count, we see that per micro, I'm sorry, per cubic millimeter of blood, or we could express it as per microliter of blood. If you remember using those micro pipettes in intro biology, a microliter is a teeny, teeny amount. And on average, we see about 5 million of these red blood cells. Remember 10 to the sixth is um, million, a million. Now in males, this number will be a bit higher, perhaps pushing 6 million and females a bit lower, perhaps pushing more like 4 million. But that's an incredible number. And these red blood cells are pumped around in our blood um, over and over and over and over and over again, all day long, day after day after day. And consequently, they, you know, they get squeezed into these tiny little capillaries. Sometimes those capillaries have a diameter that is smaller, smaller than the diameter of a typical red blood cell, which is more around seven to eight micrometers, as you can see here on this diagram. So imagine the capillaries being smaller. That means that these red blood cells have to start folding up to be able to pass through. At any rate, the point I'm trying to make is that these red blood cells have kind of a rough life, bouncing around in those blood vessels, squeezing through those tiny little capillaries, so they wear out. They wear out and they do not have a nucleus or organelles because they lose that nucleus and organelles when they are being formed in the red bone marrow, as we'll discuss shortly. And if they do not have a nucleus, that means they do not have DNA. If they do not have DNA, they cannot make mRNA. And if they do not have mRNA, they cannot make new proteins by means of protein synthesis to repair their cell membrane. Remember, cell membranes are made up of phospholipids and many proteins, proteins that are often uh, receptor proteins and ion channels and so on. So red blood cells literally cannot repair themselves. So their lifespan is limited to approximately 120 days. I'm going to circle the numbers that you have to memorize um, for, for your tests. Now, as I said, these red blood cells, they do not have a nucleus, they don't have organelles, because they're just stuffed with hemoglobin stuffed to the max, almost all of the contents of a red blood cell is hemoglobin. Now, our red blood cells have a, an interesting shape as well. They're almost the shape of a donut, except they don't have a hole per se, but where the hole is in the donut, we just have a much thinner um, portion of the cell right there. Now, remember, any time a cell is not perfectly smooth, that means that we're increasing surface area. And this is a good thing because these red blood cells are stuffed with hemoglobin. It's to the hemoglobin inside of the red blood cells that oxygen binds and even carbon dioxide, as we'll see later on. And so the more surface area there is, the more chances that oxygen molecules have to diffuse across the cell membrane of our red blood cells to then end up binding to the hemoglobin. And it's also an easier way for the oxygen to be then diffuse away from the hemoglobin through that enlarged cell membrane so that the oxygen can supply the tissues. Because of that shape, all these red blood cells can also easily stack. So I'm going to attempt to draw uh, what we refer to as the rouleau effect, and I pronounce it the French way, um, rouleau referring to a roll or a cylinder. So imagine if I look at the red blood cells sideways, they're kind of shaped like this, therefore. 
and they can very easily stack, sort of like, um, I'm not doing a very good job here, they can very easily stack sort of like this. Um, think of um, little certs mints that you might buy at the store. I don't even know if they still exist, but you can buy a little roll of candy or mints, right? Um, and that's sort of how these red blood cells can stack, which makes it much easier for them to pass through some of the narrower blood vessels and still allow for many of them to pass through. As I mentioned though, capillaries are often of a diameter less than seven to eight micrometers. This is a diameter you should remember for the rest of your life because the, there are, you know, a third of our cells um, are red blood cells. So all of the other cells we can compare to our red blood cells. So if you memorize that red blood cells are about seven to eight micrometers and you see other cells next to them, you can estimate how much bigger or smaller the other cells are. Um, but co to come back to those tiny little capillaries, if these red blood cells are bigger in diameter, they don't have a choice but to fold to be able to make it through those, those tiny little capillaries. And so this size, this, this shape, I should say, and the way we refer to that shape is to call it biconcave discs or biconcave, uh, allows them to be very flexible. Red blood cells are going to affect our blood's viscosity, our blood's syrupness. So the more red blood cells we have in our blood, the thicker our blood is. For instance, when we become very dehydrated, we're going to see that we're having less plasma and relatively speaking, much more um, red blood cells and it thickens our blood, which in some situations can get dangerous. There are some other in, uh, interesting facts. I don't need you to memorize these numbers down here, but um, because of the short lifespan and because we need so many of our red blood cells, we replace every day about 1% of our red blood cells. Now think again of how many we have in a tiny, tiny little microliter of blood. So that's a lot of work that our body and our red bone marrow must go through by means of hematopoiesis. And then also we find that there are about two and a half trillion red blood cells in a healthy adult, just an enormous number. So what makes our red blood cells red is the presence of hemoglobin because when hemoglobin binds oxygen to form a molecule better referred to as oxyhemoglobin, it tends to look rather bright red. So oxyhemoglobin is the oxidized version of hemoglobin. Now, remember that that oxygen eventually needs to make it to the tissues or the cells in the tissues so they can go through the process of cellular respiration and make ATP. So eventually some of that oxygen comes off the hemoglobin. And when we have this reduced version of hemoglobin, we refer to it as the ox deoxyhemoglobin and it looks a darker red. Now the way this appears through our skin, if you look at the back of your hand and you see the veins there, you know, our blood looks blue. It really isn't blue. It's just a darker red. It's, uh, and, and it's, um, it, it has a bluish color uh, because of, of our skin and, and uh, various reasons. Now, it's important for hemoglobin to be inside of our red blood cells. It's a, it's a, um, a polypeptide, so it's a, a protein, I should say, made up of several um, um, peptide chains, as we'll see here in just a moment. And if we had hemoglobin just floating around freely in the blood, it would actually really, really change the viscosity of the blood. It would increase it way, way too much. Um, so it's, it's important for it to stay inside of our red blood cells. There are even some additional reasons that you might pick up uh, in your book. Hemoglobin makes up most of our red blood cells. You can refer to the red blood cells as just baggies of hemoglobin. So let's take a look at a number here. And again, I'd like for you to be aware of this. So more than 250 million 
molecules are present in one red blood cell, that is in one red blood cell, one red blood cell has 250, one red blood cell has 250 million hemoglobin molecules. That's crazy. Let's come back to that number in a little while. On a blood report, you will often also see hemoglobin amounts in your patient's blood. And they're going to always have to be around 15 grams per 100 milliliter of blood. I, I don't need for you to memorize these numbers for your tests, but just, you know, maybe you're already working with patients and you can look back at these notes I provide to you uh, so that your blood reports of your patients make much more sense. So in, in males, it'll be more at the upper end of 15. In females, it would be at the lower end of 15. Now, I mentioned this earlier, hemoglobin can also bind carbon dioxide, and, and it's a very normal thing. We'll learn more about that. When hemoglobin binds to carbon dioxide, we call it carbamino hemoglobin, and it's called that because the carbon dioxide actually binds to an amino acid on the hemoglobin molecule. We'll see that oxygen binds in a very different place. It doesn't bind to the protein portion of hemoglobin. Now, unfortunately, there is a molecule that can compete with oxygen. And that is a very dangerous molecule to compete with oxygen. We call it carbon monoxide. And you all have heard of carbon monoxide poisoning. Well, when we're in an environment where carbon monoxide starts to accumulate, that carbon monoxide will kick off oxygen from hemoglobin and take oxygen's place on hemoglobin to produce a new molecule referred to as carboxyhemoglobin. So carbon monoxide is a competitor for oxygen, and that's why carbon monoxide poisoning is so, is so dangerous. Let's take a look now at the hemoglobin structure and learn exactly where oxygen binds. I've mentioned that hemoglobin is a protein. We could even say it's a protein pigment because after all, it gives our blood that reddish color, but it, it's not just a protein. It's actually made up of a protein component we call globin, one globin, and then in this protein complex, we have what we refer to as heme cores, and there are four of them. If we look here at our picture, then we very clearly see all these little snake-like structures, and those are, are polypeptides that collectively form our protein. You may recall learning about the three-dimensional structures of proteins in introductory biology, and you always learned that hemoglobin is a very good example of a protein with a quaternary structure. Most proteins, like many enzymes, tend to be a tertiary structure. And then when you learned about, let's say, collagen fibers and elastic fibers, those are better examples of um, linear proteins, secondary um, structured proteins. So hemoglobin, because it's made up of um, four different polypeptide chains, two of them are called alpha and two of them are called beta polypeptide chains, it's a quaternary type of protein. Now, within each one of those polypeptides in the center, more or less, we have these heme groups. You see them as disks here, and you see the heme group's molecular structure on your right. So this is an example of the molecular structure of a heme group. And within this heme group, we find an iron atom, and it's here to this iron atom that oxygen binds. So per iron, we see the binding of one oxygen, and each heme core has one iron. 
attached or um, each heme core contains one iron uh, ion, I really should say. And attached to each iron is one oxygen molecule. So the total number of oxygen molecules per hemoglobin would be one, two, three, four. That would be the maximum number of oxygen molecules that can bind to one hemoglobin molecule. Is that always the case? No. When hemoglobin in the red blood cells goes into the capillaries that feed our tissues that are craving oxygen, we're going to see that oxygen will leave hemoglobin little by little. Maybe not all four of them, maybe just one of them, maybe just two of them per hemoglobin molecule. It all depends on the demands of the tissues. But let's come back to numbers earlier. Remember approximately how many hemoglobin molecules we find per red blood cell? So in one red blood cell, we find approximately 250 million um, hemoglobin molecules. So if we have per hemoglobin molecules a maximum of four oxygen molecules that can bind, that means that one hemoglobin molecule could potentially carry a billion oxygen molecules, and that is in one red blood cell. That's, again, a crazy, crazy number. I introduced you in a previous video to the term hematopoiesis, which is the collective process for the formation of all formed elements. But we can separate the different uh, pathways within hematopoiesis. There's a pathway that gives rise to just the red blood cells, to just the white blood cells, and to just the platelets. And so if we, since we're focusing here on red blood cells, we will take a look at so, the so-called process of erythropoiesis. And you can guess what that means, the making of red blood cells. Now, we see that red blood cells ultimately do not have a nucleus, do not have organelles. And the primary reason for this is because they need to just jam-pack themselves with all of that hemoglobin. But of course, how does that hemoglobin get there? Well, hemoglobin, as you know by now, is mainly a protein with some heme group, with a bunch of heme groups, I should say. But to make protein, cells have to go through protein synthesis. That requires DNA and RNA and ribosomes and rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus, the whole bit. So there, there is a point throughout the process of erythropoiesis where we see all of this happening. So let's take a look here on the right at the process of uh, erythropoiesis and notice <clears throat> that when we are in the red bone marrow, we see that our hematopoietic stem cell is going to become a myeloid stem cell. You already knew that. And if it's triggered properly, it's going to give rise to a pro-erythroblast, which I cut this off, there really should be uh, an erythroblast in between here, that eventually then becomes a reticulocyte. And the reticulocyte is what gets ejected into the blood. So what enters into the bloodstream is not quite yet a mature red blood cell. Reticulocytes, as you can see, in this figure here and near the bottom here are immature red blood cells that actually still have a bit of ribosomes and maybe some rough endoplasmic reticulum left in them uh, in an attempt to keep cranking out more and more hemoglobin. They have lost most of their other organelles by now and certainly the nucleus. So if we go back to the three major phases that need to occur in order to create a, a red blood cell, we need to start out by uh, making sure that our, our cell that is about to give rise to a red blood cell has many, many ribosomes, um, possibly many, many 
um, lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum because remember we need ribosomes to make proteins. Then they can start cranking out the proteins, we call hemoglobin, and then eventually we need to get rid of the nucleus and the other organelles. Why? So that there is much, much more space for more and more hemoglobin. And that's why we see these reticulous sites with some remaining ribosomes and rough endoplasmic reticulum to make the last bit of hemoglobin. And when we're in the bloodstream, we see that the reticulocytes are there for about one or two days uh, when they finally become um, official red blood cells. Now, the number of reticulocytes in the blood is important. Um, again, when you look at a patient's blood report, uh, you will almost always see a number that reflects the number of re reticulocytes in the blood that number is going to reflect how many red blood cells are formed in the red bone marrow. So the, the red reticulocytes are a reflection of how healthy erythropoiesis is in your patient. Is erythropoiesis occurring at a healthy rate? Is it too slow or is it uh, occurring way too fast? One last thing to mention, notice that from the proerythroblast to a reticulocyte takes about seven days, so not all that long. Let's take a look now at what our body needs or what these red blood cells need to be formed. And for this we need to of course address nutrients, after all if we're going to crank out red blood cells, we need lots and lots of hemoglobin, which means we need to have the amino acids to make the globin portion of hemoglobin, but also iron, so that the iron can be uh, created or can be um, can help form our heme groups. We, of course, ingest iron through our diet, and it's important that we have healthy intestines so that our small intestine can actually absorb the iron in our diet and supply eventually the blood with that iron. Much of our iron is, is stored in various places, as you see, liver, spleen, and marrow, and we do always lose some iron um, in the form of feces and our urine or sweat, so the, 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 the typical excretions. Menstruating females, of course, are going to lose a lot more iron um, through the loss of blood. Finally, it's important that we have a nice um, diet with vitamin B12 and folic acid. This is the primary reason, too, for why uh, a woman who is about to get pregnant or who has discovered she's pregnant has a healthy intake of these two vitamins. And why is that? Well, vitamin B12 and, and folic acid play a very important role in DNA synthesis such that cells can divide. Well, remember how many red blood cells we crank out every single day. So therefore, in order for us to have the proper rate of erythropoiesis, we must have proper levels of these two vitamins. If there is any form of a deficiency of these vitamins, perhaps um, our, we're not having a good diet or there is a problem with our small intestine to where these vitamins cannot be taken out of the blood, I'm sorry, taken out of the lumen of the small intestine and brought into the blood, remember we call that absorption, we're going to be suffering from something we call pernicious anemia, pernicious anemia. So anemia, by the way, you guys, is not always due to not enough iron. There are many different forms of anemia, and anemia literally just refers to the fact that we do not have enough red blood cells. And there are many reasons for why a person might not have enough red blood cells. And here you see an example of what we call pernicious anemia. If, for instance, um, we cannot absorb vitamin Bs, then it might be due to the fact, too, that our stomach is not producing the hormone 
called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is a hormone necessary in order for us to be able to absorb these vitamins. And this is a hormone produced by the stomach. By the way, people who have their stomach stapled or reduced um, often need to be supplemented with intrinsic factor so they will not start suffering from pernicious anemia. Okay, so those are all the nutrients we definitely need. But we also need a hormone, yet another hormone, a hormone that is called erythropoietin. I think you can translate this now, red, the making of red blood cells, the making of red blood cells. EPO, you might have heard of, e of um, EPO in many of the drug advertisements for uh, patients who have cancer and it's um, many cancer patients are injected with recombinant or bioengineered EPO to help them stimulate stimulate their red bone marrow uh, to go through erythropoiesis and, and produce more red blood cells. Patients who are going through chemo are going to exper experience a rapid decline in their formed elements because of course chemo therapy chemicals tend to go after rapidly dividing cells. Now, where does erythropoietin come from? Well, it's a hormone, and most of it is produced by our kidneys. It's a very important hormone that our kidneys produce. We don't tend to think of our kidneys as a hormone-producing organ, or hormone-producing organs, I should say, because after all, we have two kidneys. But um, kidneys produce a variety of hormones, as you'll learn more and more about. Now, we'll see that our kidneys will crank out more EPO if there is an increase in testosterone levels, which is the prime reason, for instance, why males have more red blood cells than females. But we'll also see an increase in the secretion of EPO when we suffer from a condition called hypoxia. And if you translate this, it says hypo, which means, of course, low. And oxia, a bit of overlap there, referring to oxygen. So if our body suffers from low oxygen levels, and there are many reasons for why that might be the case, not just perhaps because we don't have enough red blood cells, it could be because of respiratory issues, then we'll see that the kidneys will try to compensate for this hypoxic uh, situation in the body by cranking out more EPO. The EPO will then bind to the stem cells in the red bone marrow such that the erythropoiesis rate starts to increase. I mentioned earlier that cancer patients might need a shot of EPO or genetically engineered or recombinant EPO. Unfortunately, athletes abuse EPO or recombinant EPO. Athletes might inject themselves with EPO in an attempt to increase their red blood cell numbers before a race. And of course, if they have more red blood cells, they can carry more oxygen in their body. If they can carry more oxygen in their, their body, their, their cells can crank out more ATP, which means their muscles and their heart can work uh, much better. There are other forms of blood doping. For instance, some athletes remove red blood cells, keep them stored for a while, and shortly before a ra their race, they will re-inject themselves with uh, the supply of their own red blood cells. Um, and by then, of course, they've already made up for the red blood cells they took away earlier. And so now they have extra red blood cells. When we have many, too many red blood cells, we refer to that condition as polycythemia. Oops, I just misspelled that. Let me redo that. Polycythemia, literally meaning too many cells in the blood, and, and we tend to refer uh, to red blood cells. So blood doping can do that. Now think about this. Is this a, a smart thing to do for athletes? Remember what these red blood cells do to our blood. They increase the viscosity of our blood. Think of our, your blood becoming more and more syrupy. Um, that's not a good thing. It makes it more sluggish. Um, 
and can create all kinds of heart issues. And that's what sometimes can kill athletes. Eventually, the damaged red blood cells need to be removed from the bloodstream. And this happens with the help of macrophages that we find in the liver, in the spleen, in the red bone marrow, places like that. The hemoglobin is going to be taken apart into its two major components. Remember that is the globin and the heme part. The globin will evolve, eventually fall apart into amino acids. The heme is going to fall apart into iron and biliverdin. Rather than using this text slide, let's move on now to the next diagram that gives you a very nice overview of the fates of each one of these uh, products that make up our hemoglobin. So over here on the left hand side we see our red blood cells that are arriving in the spleen or the liver or it might even happen in the red bone marrow and they need to be um, removed from the bloodstream. They're no good anymore so the macrophages take them apart into globin and uh, their heme group. So that's step two. The globin can fall apart into individual amino acids, which can then be uh, used to make all kinds of new proteins, including hemoglobin. The heme group, as um, we mentioned, will fall apart into biliverdin and iron. And then the iron can either be stored in the liver or it can um, hang out in the plasma as long as it's bound to this plasma protein we call transferrin. Um, if we need some of the stored iron in the liver, it can leave the liver, but once again, it needs to be attached to that transferrin protein. And then it can, um, via the bloodstream, make it to the red bone marrow to eventually make, um, help make new um, hemoglobin molecules and red blood cells. The biliverdin uh, is going to become bilirubin. The bilirubin is going to become part of the bile, which is produced by the liver. This bile via a duct will get dumped into, small, into the small intestine. And in the small intestine, this bile with the bilirubin in it is what helps us break down fats and um, some of that bilirubin will then get, it doesn't show that on this diagram, but some of it actually gets recycled back to the liver um, or returned to the liver, I should say, to be reused and therefore recycled to make a new bile. Um, while a good portion of the bilirubin, on the other hand, will just be excreted in the form of feces or even in the form of urine. So that wraps up our discussion of the red blood cells.